Right. So, uh, what we do now is uh, we work out the Schwinger Dyson equation using the Feynman diagrams. Uh, let C n represent the set of all connected graphs, connected diagrams with no source vertices and n external legs. Now, and let A n represent the set of all connected graphs with one ingoing leg and n outgoing legs, precisely n outgoing external lines and one ingoing line. So, it is clearly uh, obvious that C n plus 1 is equal to A n, because C n represents the total number of legs, uh, whereas A n represents the outgoing legs and we correspond uh, to one in ingoing leg. So, A, uh, A n is corresponding to C n plus 1. We represent A n and therefore, C n plus 1 by this diagram, this uh, line with a blob. Now, let us see if a, if a particle enters the uh, system, enters the interaction uh, chamber, let us say, uh, which is which is represented by this blob, which is represented by this blob, which we have seen earlier. And this represents the interaction and along a single ingoing line, along the ingoing line, what are the various possibilities that can happen? The first possibility is that uh, the particle does not interact uh, at all and if it does not interact at all, it moves out or it leaves the system uh, it precisely in the manner uh, that it was before it interacted or before it entered into the blob. So, that therefore, and that is represented by a straight line, this particular uh, possibility, this particular possibility, the possibility of no end interaction that is in a sense the free field is represented by a straight line and it evaluates to delta n comma 1, 1 upon mu. Why delta n comma 1? Because in this case, the out number of outgoing legs has to be 1 by default, because the number of in incoming legs is 1, there is no interaction. Therefore, the number of outgoing legs also has to be 1. The second possibility is that the incoming particle encounters a 4 point vertex. Please note, we are working in 5 4 field. 5 4 theory. So, the particle interacts uh, encounters a 4 point vertex and when it interacts the 4 point vertex, the possibilities are that it could, uh, it could go along any of these 3 directions and then encounter another blob uh, with, with the first blob corresponding to n 1 external legs, the second blob corresponding to n 2 external legs and the third blob corresponding to n 3 external legs. In other words, the incoming line at the vertex splits up into 3 outgoing lines, with each of which these outgoing lines ends up in a blob. The first one, first blob relates to n 1 external legs the second one relates to n 2 external legs and the third one relates to n 3 external legs. So, clearly n 1 plus n 2 plus n 3 must be equal to n and number 2, uh, the, the symmetry factor is 1 upon 3 factorial clearly, because uh, they can be these 3 blobs can be interchanged in 3 factorial ways without disturbing the diagram. And uh, the number of ways in which we can select n 1 identical lines in blob 1, n 2 identical lines in blob 2 and n 3 identical lines in blob 3 out of a total of n objects is given by n factorial divided by uh, n 1 factorial, n 2 factorial, n 3 factorial. And a n 1 represents the value of this blob, first blob, upper blob, a n 2 represents the value of the middle blob and a n 3 represents the value of the third blob and the value of this vertex is equal to minus lambda 4 and the value of this incoming line is equal to 1 upon mu. So, the entire value of this diagram is equal to this whole expression. Let me recall because it's a, this is the first one. Uh, the incoming line is giving me a factor of 1 upon mu, 
the vertex here is giving me a factor of minus lambda 4 and then when we have this this line and this blob this line and this blob are giving me a factor of a n 1 this gives the first line and blob the top line and blob give me a factor of a n 1 the middle line and blob give me a factor of a n 2 and the bottom line and blob give me a factor of a n 3 asymmetry factor because uh, we can interchange between these blobs interchange across these blobs and therefore, we have a symmetry factor of 1 upon 3 factorial and the number of ways in which we can select n 1 lines or uh, n 1 outgoing lines out of a total of n lines uh, and n 2 uh, n 1 identical lines out of a total of n lines n 2 identical lines out of a total of n lines n 3 identical lines out of a total of n lines subject to the constraint n 1 plus n 2 plus n 3 is equal to 1 n is given by n factorial divided by n 1 factorial n 2 factorial n 3 factorial. So, this is the whole expression corresponding to this Feynman diagram. The third possibility is that the particle encounters a vertex, it encounters a vertex. The incoming line splits up into three lines, one of the lines encounters a blob and the two other lines encounter a common blob as shown in the diagram. The incoming line splits into three lines because we are we have a four vertex for uh, therefore, the one incoming line we have three outgoing lines the one of the outgoing lines has a separate blob and the two other two lines have a common blob. So, in the value of this factor let us this diagram let us work it out. Uh, again we have al one vertex that gives me minus lambda 4, the incoming line gives me minus 1 upon mu and uh, now this this line, this blob and this line, this uh, upper line and the blob, upper line and the blob give me a factor of a n 1 and the bottom lines give me a factor of a n 2 plus 1 y n 2 plus 1 because here we are having two incoming lines. If you look at the bottom blob, uh, we are having n outgoing lines, but not one incoming line, we are having two incoming lines. So, instead of a n 2, it now has a factor of a n 2 plus 1, it now has an argument of n 2 plus 1, because now we have two, remember what was a n 2, a n 2 was one incoming and n 2 outgoing. Now, we have two incoming and n 2 outgoing therefore, the argument of a is n 2 plus 1 and the, uh, uh, the uh, upper one obviously, evaluates to a n 1 and uh, uh, the symmetry factor because the uh, the two uh, the two lines here can be flipped uh, among each other. So, we get a symmetry factor of 1, uh, one upon 2 factorial and uh, the number of ways out of n objects we can pick up n 1 similar objects and n 2 similar objects is given by n factorial upon n 1 factorial into n 2 factorial. So, this explains the valuation of this diagram. So, this is the second case which case we have one incoming line uh, uh, branching into three lines, one line going away to a separate blob, to the two other lines coming back to a common blob. Now, we come to the fourth case. In the fourth case, uh, you encounter all the three lines, you encounter a vertex, you split into three lines and all the three lines re, uh, reunite or enter into the same blob. Therefore, in this case, what happens is and this, this can happen in only one way. So, we have n factorial upon n factorial that is one way, uh, but the lines can be interchanged amongst each other in three factorial ways. So, the symmetry factor is 1 upon 3 factorial. Now, we as far as this blob is concerned, uh, we have three incoming lines and n outgoing lines because you have three incoming lines, one incoming lines gave me a n. Uh, therefore, if you have three incoming lines, you have a n plus 2. 
uh, remember a n was 1 incoming line n outgoing lines. In this case, we have 3 incoming lines n outgoing lines. So, that corresponds to the argument n plus 2 for the function a. And of course, the as usual as in the previous cases, the vertex gives me a factor of minus lambda 4 and uh, the line uh, incoming line gives me a factor of minus mu. What we do, do now? To obtain a generating function for a n, what we do now is we multiply the entire expression that we have, the sum of all the Feynman diagrams that we have, case a plus case b plus case c plus case t. We multiply throughout by j and j to the power n upon n factorial, we multiply them throughout and we sum over n multiply everything by j to the power n by n factorial and we sum over n. The left hand side represents the field function phi j uh, phi symbol j and let us see what we get for the right hand side. The first expression is quite straightforward. The first expression because of this delta function n comma 1 it will pick out n equal to 1 term. So, we will end up with j upon mu. So, the first expression evaluates to simply j upon mu, it is independent of n. Now, we come to the evaluation of the second term. Let us look at the evaluation of the second term. The second term is given by the expression at the top of your slide. Uh, remember the constraint is n 1 plus n 2 plus n 3 is equal to n, but please note n 1 plus n 3 n 2 plus n 3. Uh, 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 equal to n with n being sum from 0 to infinity. So, we can write this as j n can be written as j n 1 plus n 2 plus n 3 j to the power n can be written as j to the power n 1 plus n 2 plus n 3. The n factorials cancel out uh, these terms are as it is the, the 1 upon 3 factorial term is as it is. Now, if you pick this one a n 1 together with 1 upon n 1 factorial together with j n 1, this whole term is nothing but phi of j. If you look at the definition of phi of j, let us go back. The definition of phi of j is j to the power n upon n factorial a n. This is precisely what is happening is j to the power n 1 n 1 factorial a n 1 this is nothing but phi of j. Similarly, for j to the power n 2 n 2 factorial a n 2 this gives me another factorial of another factor of phi of j. j n 3 n 3 factorial a n 3 gives me another factor of phi of j. So, we have in all this whole thing condenses to phi and, and the summation is remember uh, over n greater than equal to 0 to infinity. So, we can write it as n 1 comma n 2 comma n 3 greater than equal 0 to infinity and therefore, uh, we can decompose this expression into phi j into phi j into phi j that is phi j whole cube. The rest is as it is minus lambda 4 upon mu is retained and so is the symmetry factor 1 upon 3 factorial. So, the second term in a nutshell evaluates to the expression that is given in the green box. Let us look at the third term. The third term again adopting the same methodology uh, uh, as far as n 1 is concerned it gives me phi of j if you look carefully we have j n 1 j to the power n 1 here we have n 1 factorial we have a n 1 here. So, this whole expression gives me phi of j, but the problem here is in the case of n 2 we have a n 2 plus 1. So, we need to handle this let us look at this term carefully this term is uh, rewritten as isolated and rewritten in the red box. Uh, a summation n 2 greater than equal to 0 j to the power n 2 1 upon n 2 factorial a n 2 plus 1. I can write it as j summation n 2 plus 1 greater than equal to 1 
j n 2 can be written as j n 2 plus 1 minus 1, uh, 1 upon n 2 factorial can be written as 1 upon n 2 plus 1 minus 1 factorial and a n 2 plus 1 is written as it is. Now, simply changing the index uh, from n 2 to n 2 plus 1 and renaming it as n 2, we get n 2 greater than equal to 1 j n 2 minus 1 1 upon n 2 minus 1 factorial a n 2 and this is nothing but phi dash of j the first derivative of j with respect to first derivative of phi j with respect to j. So, we substitute that here and we get the valuation for the case c. We have got valuation for case a, we have got valuation for case b, we have got valuation for case c. For case d, we proceed similarly and we get this valuation for case d. Now, let us substitute everything. When we substitute everything, uh, in uh, the left hand side is phi j of course, the right hand side as per the various valuations that we have done, we get the expression here uh, uh, in the green box. And the very interesting part is this is precisely the equation that we have obtained earlier uh, in the previous uh, derivation of the Schwinger Dyson equation for the field function, exactly the same equation we have obtained. So, we come to a very fundamental inference, a very important inference, but before that in just uh, um, brief on the on the various other parameters. The generating function for the connected green functions are given by this expression that is log of z j. Therefore, w dash w j is the is the generating function for the connected green function that is given by log of z j. Uh, w dash j is, is because w j is the log of z j. So, w dash j is equal to z dash j upon z j and phi j is equal to this expression by definition and that can be written in the terms of as I mentioned a n is equal to j n plus uh, c n plus 1, a n is equal to c n plus 1 I am sorry, a n is equal to c n plus 1. So, we write c n plus 1 here and we find that phi j is equal to w dash j is equal to z dash j upon z j. Now, phi j is e given by this expression if I substitute phi j equal to z j z dash j upon z j what do I get? I get the Schwinger Dyson equation for the path integral for the generating function which is given in the green box here. Using the expression in the red box which we have derived just now from Feynman diagrams and using the definition of phi j that we have just obtained here phi j is equal to z dash j upon z j the last equation on your slide on this slide uh, we obtain the expression or the Schwinger Dyson equation for the path integral or the generating function. Now, z j by definition is equal to this expression uh, n integral d phi exponential minus s phi plus j phi. If you set if you use the Schwinger Dyson equation that we have just now put derived uh, lambda 4 upon 6 z triple dash j plus mu z dash j minus j z j. If you operate, if you substitute z j equal to this, we get n integral d phi lambda 4 upon 6 because you see z j and the derivatives of z j when they operate on uh, this. Uh, when you differentiate z j with respect to j, every di differential will pull down a factor of phi and bring it within the integral. So, that is precisely what is happening here. When you differentiate z j 3 times with respect to j, you pull down a factor of phi cube. When you differentiate once, you, dif you bring down a factor of phi. And uh, z j as it is brings you j. So, in the net result is when this this expression 
uh, operates on z j in a sense uh, you bring down a factor of lambda 4 upon 6 phi cube z plus mu phi minus j of course, this is within the integral uh, with respect to d phi. And if you look carefully, if you recall the expression for the action, uh, what was the expression for the action 1 uh, e to the power uh, 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 if you recall the expression for the action s is equal to 1 upon 2 mu phi square plus 1 by 4 uh, lambda sigma um, phi to the power 4 uh, minus j phi. Then uh, clearly this expression is nothing but s dash of phi minus j. Uh, of course, if you in include j within the action uh, and then it becomes a part of the action. Otherwise, if you take j as separate, uh, then it becomes uh, s dash phi minus j. Let me write it down s phi is equal to 1 by 2 mu of phi square plus 1 upon 24 lambda phi 4. Now, if you differentiate this, you get mu of phi, mu of phi, which we have here, uh, uh, plus lambda four upon uh, phi, uh, lambda four upon lambda four phi cube upon six, which you have here, and of course j is there in both cases. So we get this expression s dash phi minus j here. Now if you look uh, if we we can write this expression s dash phi minus j exponential minus s phi plus j phi as minus integral d by d phi exponential minus s phi plus j phi and that turns out to be uh, integral of a total derivative d exponential minus s phi plus j phi which is equal to 0 because it depends only on the endpoints and the endpoints are plus minus infinity and we assume that the action at these two points uh, uh, is is 0 or the action drops off sufficiently rapidly so that at the two extremes uh, minus infinity and plus infinity action uh, uh, vanishes now this the re, these inferences are very interesting the Schwinger Dyson equation for z j must hold by definition. We got it here, we got this expression here the Schwinger Dyson equation must hold by definition. But the Schwinger Dyson equation for z j corresponds to the given Schwinger Dyson equation for phi j. You see, if, if you recall this expression, this Schwinger Dyson equation, which we obtained directly from the first principle from z j itself from the definition of z j. If you go back uh, this Schwinger Dyson equation is also obtained from the Schwinger Dyson equation for phi j that is up, uh, given in your red box. But the Schwinger Dyson equation for phi j has been worked out using the combinatorial uh, symmetry factors. No, you see how did we work this out? We got it from the Feynman diagrams and in the Feynman diagrams, the symmetry factors that we plugged in were based on certain combinatorial rules uh, or combinatorics of the diagram, the various nuances or the various uh, topologies of the diagrams, uh, various diagrams. Uh, so, what is the what is the net inference? The net inference is that those very specific symmetry factors are the correct specific coefficients and the only correct co specific coefficients uh, that can that can be used in at those places because they give rise to this hierarchy of results. Let me repeat this is fundamental the Schwinger Dyson equation for z j can be directly obtained straight away from the value of z j as equal to n integral uh, um, exponential um, minus uh, s uh, uh, plus uh, minus j phi uh, d phi. So, that, that you can obtain right away from z j from this. 
n exponential minus s phi plus j phi. This can be used to obtain the Schwinger Dyson equation. But this, this Schwinger Dyson equation ha, can also be obtained directly from phi j and phi j can has been obtained directly from Feynman diagrams and Feynman diagrams contain that specific symmetry factors. Therefore, the specific symmetry factors must be the correct symmetry factors because the outcome is correct at the end of the day the Schwinger Dyson equation that we get for z j coincides with the original uh, Schwinger Dyson equation that we get from first principles. Now, we talk about loop expansions. This is another interesting topic. You see uh, fundamentally this whole theory is perturbation theory. Now, if we have one coupling constant to handle this issue of loop expansion does not become very significant because uh, we have terms only the power series is only in one particular coupling constant. What happens if we have two coupling constant for example, if we have phi to the power, uh, power 3 public 4 theories 3 by 4 theories. In that case, we have two coupling constant lambda 3 and lambda 4. So, therefore, the perturbative terms, the terms in the perturbative uh, uh, series will be of the form lambda uh, lambda 3 uh, to the power p lambda 4 to the power q. Now, to truncate or to determine to ascertain the point of truncation of the perturbation series we need to have a relative assessment of the magnitudes of these two coupling constants. Where exactly the truncation is to be done would depend on the relative magnitudes of the two coupling constant lambda 3 and lambda 4. For example, if lambda 3 is of the order of lambda 4, then lambda 4 square would be much greater than uh, lambda 3 to the power 4 please remember we written both of them are very small. So, lambda 4 square would be much larger than lambda 3 to the power 4, but however, if lambda 3 square is of the order of lambda 4 then the situation would be different then lambda 4 square and lambda 3 to the power 4 would be comparable and would have to be taken cognizance of. Now, to manage this problem you see so far we have been doing perturbation theory and we have been expanding the perturbation series in terms of the coupling constant that is in terms of the lambdas the power series in lambdas we did it in case of lambda 4 theory in the powers of lambda. Instead of doing that we introduce a new parameter into the into the arrangement uh, and that parameter uh, uh, does the expansion or does the perturbation expansion on the basis of the number of closed loops of the Feynman diagrams. Num the perturbation uh, or the Feynman diagrams of the, of the perturbation series would contain more and more number of loops. So, the expansion can be identified in respect of or with reference to the number of loops that a particular term contains. So, we can decide upon the truncation on the basis of the number of closed loops up to which the perturbation terms are to be retained and therefore, uh, in other words we have to now introduce a bookkeeping device, bookkeeping device in respect of the number of loops in a particular term. We identify this by introducing a parameter h bar uh, into the Feynman diagrams one h bar for corresponding to one loop. If a diagram has one loop, we attribute a factor of h bar to the diagram to the loop and if a factor has two loops, a factor of h bar square to the two loops and so on. Let us see how it works. Now, the Schwinger Dyson equation uh, if you recall the Schwinger Dyson equation for the phi 4 theory, the field function of the phi 4 theory is given at the top of your slide. Now, if you recall the diagrams also, if you recall the diagrams also, it was these two diagrams 
this last, last diagram and the second last diagram that contained loops. The second last diagram phi j and del by uh, or the diagram corresponding to this term phi j phi dash j, uh, j uh, corresponding corresponded to a Feynman diagram with one loop and phi double dash j corresponding to a Feynman diagram with two loops. Uh, therefore, if we insert a factor of h bar corresponding to each loop the revised Schwinger Dyson equation will take the form given at the bottom of your slide. We will have a factor of h bar in the second last term and a factor of h bar square in the last term. Remember the last term had two loops, so we had a factor of h bar square and the preceding term uh, had a, a single loop and we have a factor of h bar. Now, in the context of loop expansion, the other quantities also need to be uh, re redefined uh, when we are introducing this factor h bar into our Schringer Dyson equation. It is quite natural that the other quantities need to be redefined. Uh, the field function is now redefined as h bar z dash upon z z uh, and that is equal to h bar del by and del by del j log of uh, z j and the Schwinger Dyson equation for the path integral becomes s dash of h d by d j z j is equal to j z j. The Schwinger Dyson equation for the phi 4 field gets modified here. Uh, uh, the expression is given on your slide lambda 4 upon 6 h bar cube z d triple dash j plus mu h bar z dash j minus j z h and uh, the z j changes to we have a factor of h bar coming into play uh, uh, together with the action. Uh, as you can see the green functions also get modified, they contain a factor of h bar uh, and the connected green functions also get modified and most importantly the re to reiterate the path integral also gets modified by introducing a factor of 1 upon h bar. So, if we want to do a loop expansion, we simply need to introduce a factor of 1 upon h bar in the path integral. Now, relative magnitudes from uh, from on the expression for the action we have this uh, simple expression we know that the action is given by 1 upon 2 mu phi square plus 1 upon 3 factorial lambda 3 phi q plus 1 upon 4 factorial lambda 4 phi to the power 4 uh, dividing throughout by h bar on both sides we get this expression. Now, if we want that our free field action is independent of h bar, then we set we make a transformation of variables phi is equal to chi root h. On this substitution, the h bar term in the first, first term, the free field term vanishes and we have the uh, remaining uh, remaining terms under root six under root h bar by 6 lambda 3 chi q plus h bar upon 24 lambda 4 chi to the 4. Comparison of these two comparison of powers of h clearly show that we have lambda 3 square and lambda 4 are of the same order. So, that is that is what we infer that is what we infer or what we can interpret in terms of or by introducing this factor of h bar. It is interesting that that the same inference can be drawn by the use of the of the Feynman diagrams. For example, in the case of the four vertex when you have a four vertex you have one loop that is the upper diagram that you have here this is interpreted as h bar lambda 4 lambda 4 because we have a four point vertex here and h bar is because of the one loop. Now, to reconstruct the one loop using three vertices we need two three vertices two three point vertices with one three point vertex 
it becomes uh, to construct a, a loop uh, with three point vertices you need two three point vertices. So, as a result of which because you have two three point vertices you have lambda 3 square and because of the one loop you have h bar. So, in a sense if the loops represent equivalence in some sense then we have lambda 3 square is equal to lambda 4. So, now we talk about the, the classical behavior or the tree level behavior of uh, the 5 4 theory. Okay, we will continue in the next class. Thank you.